the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The wisdom readings that began three weeks ago continue to remind us that true wisdom comes from above, from God. The letter of James says that wisdom is not measured by de degrees acquired, but by deeds of life. Wisdom does not come from acquiring knowledge in lectures or debates, but applying truth acquired to life. One of the ways those who are truly wise exhibit wisdom is through humility. True wisdom has no room for bitter envy or selfish ambition. Envy and selfish ambition come from the heart and destroy relationships and destroy community. Envy and strife are indicators that something is wrong, which the letter of James says is earthly, unspiritual, and devilish, not coming from above and producing disorder, confusion, and evil practices. Wisdom from God is pure, holy, peace-loving, considerate, full of mercy, and sincere, producing a harvest of righteousness. Last week we heard that the tongue, though a relatively small part of the body, can have a profound influence on our relationship with God and with one another. A person who controls his or her tongue and speaks with care can only do that from a place of love and spiritual maturity. One who is filled with the Holy Spirit is able to bridle their tongue because the thoughts of the heart are wrapped in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I trust you can see how, this, how all this makes sense and how the words of our mouth and the meditation of our spirit are simply reflections of what's going on in the heart and from the soul. The closer God is to your center, the more you can radiate the image and likeness of God that has been given to you. Faith helps us stand in that connection with confidence so that we may serve compassionately and speak carefully, desiring the ways of God above rather than the ways of this world. The alternative is not a pretty picture. Without the love of God and the grace of the Holy Spirit, our mouths and actions communicate strife, envy, hatred, and vitriol. These feelings obviously do not come from above. They come from within, from an infected heart, which is what Jesus said defiles a person. With God's help, we can turn from hatred to humility, judgment to justice, and boasting to belief. As it says in our epistle reading, we must submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, so that he will flee from us, draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. The disciples experienced this in our gospel reading. Immediately after Jesus had told them that he would be betrayed, killed, and rise again, they began to argue. They were arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. Anyone who has ever had the misfortune of experiencing or witnessing a family battle over an inheritance or the jockeying that goes on when a coveted position is vacated can no doubt relate. But as we know, the disciples were still learning and still had much to learn, and this occasion was no exception. Jesus called them to account, asking them about their conversation. Their first response was silence. And so Jesus sat them down and taught them the essence of true greatness, which is found in servanthood. Jesus said, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. James did not condemn the desire to improve one's position in life, but he did teach that greatness in God's kingdom was not determined by status or position, but by service. Then Jesus took a child and put it among them and said, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, 
And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Once a child has been born, our culture tends to put a high importance on that child and all children. That was not true in ancient Israel. Children were considered least of all from conception through young adulthood. To make Jesus' point, he said that welcoming and showing kindness to one of these little children was the equivalent of welcoming Jesus himself, and not only Jesus, but God the Father. Jesus was speaking to the disciples, but his message is to all of us as well. This was affirmed by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans when he said, Welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Each one of us has been welcomed into the body of Christ and is our responsibility to invite and welcome others into Christ's body as we encounter them in life, and especially those who come through the doors of St. George's. We cannot control whether or not anyone will feel welcomed. However, we can do our best to authentically welcome everyone. We do that with our words and behaviors when they communicate a welcome message. We are blessed to be members and thus stewards of God's one holy Catholic and apostolic church, extending and sharing the Lord's gracious invitation. You may wonder why the disciples didn't just ask Jesus what he meant when he said that he would be betrayed, killed, and rise again. None of us like to appear uninformed, confused, or clueless. This happens in and outside the church. I know that there are people who are hesitant to participate in a Bible study because they feel like they should know more than they do. And yet, how can we begin to tackle the tough questions like, why do good people suffer? Why is loving God and our neighbor so hard? Why does evil appear to succeed? If God's own son could be betrayed and killed, then who is safe? Why did God set up a world like this? We all have questions, and many of those questions will only be answered when we see God face to face. Asking the hard questions can keep us in dialogue with God and other Christians, and at times, God does reveal himself to us in ways that we never understood before. The best chance of that happening is to be in a Bible study and in Christian community. Even if all of our answers, our questions are not answered, we know that Jesus said, for when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Instead of waiting on our Lord to lead the way, the disciples began arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. I wonder how the conversation with the disciples would have gone if they had just asked Jesus what he meant. They did not understand what he was saying, and yet they were afraid to ask. How different would their story have been if they had waited on the Lord to hear God's will for their lives instead of allowing their egos to lead the way? Think about your own life. If we go back to our wisdom readings, Proverbs 16, 18 reads, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Daily, we need to be asking, where does our ego get in the way of God's plan for our lives? The good news is that Jesus welcomes us even when we do not understand or we do not know. This pericope closes with Jesus embracing a child, the ultimate symbol of not knowing, not understanding, immaturity, and undeveloped, and yet authentic and open vulnerable and loving. We do not need to fear our questions, our misunderstandings, our confusion, or our curiosity in the presence of the one whose perfect love casts out all fear. God loves us. He welcomes our questions. We can't hide our unknowing from him. 
When we welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us, we strive to present one another mature in Christ to the glory of God. This coming week, ask God to help you find one opportunity to joyfully reach out in love, to nurture, teach, and heal in the precious name of Jesus. And then don't be surprised when you see what happens when we truly welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. Amen.